extremely pleased to have. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so today we're extremely pleased to have uh, uh, Liang Zideng to, to talk about, uh, actually it's a sort of brand new work on, on, on a material that's, that's somewhat uh, old. What, what the new discovery they made was that uh, they, they actually was able to maintain much higher TC in, in a system that uh, intrinsically have a much lower TC. So he's gonna tell us about uh, the microscopic, uh, I mean, how, how, he, how they did that and what is the microscopic origin uh, he think about. Yeah, okay, and thank you. Yeah, Liang, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks to process, Professor Dai for the opportunity. So today I'm going to talk about some interesting uh, high pressure work uh, leading by us and also some uh, other group. So first I want to thank all the collaborators here. Of course, the group members from uh, Professor Chu's group at Tessa here, and also uh, from Professor Dai's group, and uh, as well as Professor Yan Min Ma's group in China in Jilin University and the Lin Yi University. Okay. So uh, it has been 110 years since the discovery of superconductivity. And so we can tell still it's a very uh, hot field and uh, check a lot of people's attention. And one of the reasons is really superconductivity has continuously uh, provides intellectual challenges as well as holding a, techno a, a lot of great techno technological promises, right? So uh, in earlier this year uh, on science, is posted 125 questions targeted at different fields, which are supposed to be most worthwhile for exploration and the discovery. So one of them is the mechanism behind the HTS. So besides the exploring the mechanism for the HTS, I think one of the major driving force for this field is the search for superconductors of higher TC. And also uh, during the research of superconductivity, it has a lot of interesting uh, new fields and the phenomena discovered. For example, earlier, the non-Fermi liquid behavior incorporates superconductors and also like heavy electrons in lanthanide compounds. And uh, of course, during these 110 years, it's not always smooth for superconductivity research and there has been doubts and uh, questions. So one more, one recently, there's a story I want to mention here in today's presentation is actually in 2006, Two well-known scientists actually they uh, analysis right the HTS science publication statics and they do all the uh, uh, fittings and come to a serious conclusion that superconductivity this field is going to die sometime between 2010 and uh, 2015. Since now we're already in 2021, so so we know this is definitely uh, not true, and uh, we know in uh, 2008 ionic type superconductors were, were discovered. So sometimes we really need to have faith in what we are doing. So um, through the heroic efforts of really numerous scientists, engineers, the superconducting transition TC, as shown in this uh, diagram, it has continuous clamp above prior records, right? So the compounds I want to draw attention here is for the cuprates and then the superhydrates more recently. So the Another key point I want to emphasize here, since 1994, the record TC 164 Kelvin under 31 GPA, actually that set up by Professor Chu and the co-workers has lasted for another uh, two decades, 20 years, until 2015, Aramis group announced the uh, superconductivity above 203 Kelvin and under a much higher pressure, 150 GPA. And after that, there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, high TC discovered and reported on superhydrate material. Just to name a few, in 2019, the 260 Kelvin was reported in lanthanum hydride by Hamley's group, and the 2020, last year, on the uh, so-called room temperature superconductor in the uh, carbon sulfur hydride material, which is reported to have 288 Kelvin under 267 GPA, and surprisingly, there's a collaboration work between uh, Stan Tozer's group and uh, Hamley's group. They report an even higher TC, around 556 Kelvin and above 116 GPA. So all these are very interesting and, uh, and exciting. So we know, uh, as we just show you, most of the record TCs since 1994 are all hold under high pressure. So high pressure actually really plays an important role in the material science because it can change the basic parameters of inter 
atomic in the material without changing its chemistry. It can tune carrier concentration, it can shift the Fermi level, and it can even reshape Fermi surface topology. Okay, so just to lay, uh, give some concrete examples here, it's the high pressure work actually that proves that the physical pressure is equivalent to chemical pressure and the net to the discovery of the first liquid nitrogen superconductor YBCO with a TC of 93 Kelvin in 1987. And also it helped establish the universal inverse parabolic TC relation with the carrier concentration, the TC, the, that's the universal TC versus P uh, relation that formed an important base for the theory development as well as a uh, material discovery. I also want to make a, a note here. I mean, in 2019, actually our group also discovered that we can break this universal TCP relation and uh, reach a higher, even higher TC. And we proved that in the BISCO material. And uh, lastly, the predict the metallization of hydrogen and the high pressure provides the impetus for the known history of ultra high pressure studies of hydrides, as we seen today on all those uh, HTS, even RTS reported on the superhydrides under ultra high pressure. So all the rec as we can see, all the record TCs are achieved under very high pressure. Even though these TCs lower the temperature barrier for practice, uh, for application, but it, it really raise another barrier, right? The pressure barrier, it become a major obstacle to, to applications. So nowadays, those high TC reported in superhydrides are all under pressure around the 100 GPA level, which is one microbar or 10 to the sixth order of atmosphere pressure. So that's far away from application. So the grand challenges in superconductivity research and development today, we believe is no longer restricted to further increasing teaser under extremely condition, which means under higher and higher pressure. But now we must include efforts to lower and better yet remove the applied pressure for application. So the metal stable phase can be stabilized by pressure quenching and or temperature quenching, doping, string iron gating as demonstrated in other um, systems. Uh, for daily life, we know diamonds, right? Black phosphorus and ordinary glass are very good examples. Also I read paper that for the, actually for the uh, solid chocolate, that's also a very good example for metastable phase that exists in our daily life. So our question is, can we retain pressure induced or enhance the superconductivity at ambient pressure? And uh, one step forward, is there a possibility that the retained TC can be even higher than the original TC that created or induced by the high pressure? And I want to convince you on the following slides that for both questions, our answers are yes, okay. So now let's start from the, uh, the simple case, elements. So thanks to uh, Professor Jim Schilling for this very nice periodic table of superconductivity. So here we can see there's 31 elements superconduct at ambient pressure, and there are 24 more superconduct at high pressure. And here we want to uh, draw attention to antimony, which is one of the non-superconducting elements uh, at ambient pressure by use uh, but by applying pressure, we can drop it into a superconducting state. So here we show you the phase diagram of the, of the element antimony. So under pressure, it really goes through a series of structural transitions. At ambient pressure is rhombohedral uh, structure. And then once it passes 7 GPA, it go into a monoclinic host gas structure. And then when we keep increasing the pressure past 9 GPA, it turns into tetragonal host gas structure. And then uh, between 9 GPA and uh, 22 GPA, or between 22 GPA and 28 GPA, there's a mixed phase region. We have tetragonal host gas phase and the body center cubic phase. And at the end, when we apply pressure above 28 GPA, it become pure body center cubic phase. As about the superconductivity, it appears at uh, around 5 GPA with a TC around 3.5 Kelvin, as I shown here. And also, as demonstrated in this diagram, that we observe a rapid rise in TC, which coincides with the phase boundary, the phase boundary one and two, and also here three and the mixture phase, and at last the mixture phase and the phase four. Okay, there we see a 
clear rapid rise in the transition temperature. So this result is interesting, but that's not the exciting part. The exciting part I want to tell today is how we can retain the superconductivity in this element without any pressure. So there's some, actually there are already some preliminary work done in the early days, back to the 1964, more than half a century ago. So some researchers from Cent Central Research Lab and also Bell Lab, they did a very interesting experiment. So what they did is firstly, they applied 120 kilobar on the element, uh, antimony, which is 12 GPA. And then they cooled the sample to 77 Kelvin and released the pressure. So since there's no figures presented in that paper, so I just uh, copied and this main statement. So later they find out by they performing the resistivity measurements, the two independent examples were showing superconducting transitions between 2.6 and 2.7 Kelvin, which means they can retain the superconductivity of this uh, element antimony by quenching the example at 77 Kelvin and the retained onset TC is, uh, is around 2.6 to 2.7 Kelvin, okay? And a few years later, Vitik did another uh, more detailed, though still preliminary, but more detailed comparing to the earlier version. So instead of quenching the example at 77 Kelvin, what he did is firstly cool the example to 4.2 Kelvin, right? With the pressure under 8.5 GPA, which is 85 kilobar. And that's showing by the curve four, okay? Uh, curve three. So the curve three is the superconducting transition for antimony under pressure of 8.5 GPA. And after that, he sequentially reload or um, unload the pressure, release the pressure from 8.5 GPA all the way to ambient. So the sixth the curve, uh, label number six, is really at ambient pressure without any pressure. And this still shows a superconducting transition, right? So at ambient pressure, we saw a superconductivity transition between 2.9 Kelvin and 3.2 Kelvin as demonstrated here in this curve. And also in the paper, he mentioned that the zero pressure transition was not reproducible. So it's still kind of an open question whether this is reliable, but at least it gave us an indication that the superconductivity induced by pressure in antimony can be quenched to ambient pressure, okay. Another uh, interesting experiment is uh, by doing the shock wave, basically by explosion. So what this also do, they packed a BISCO sample originally with TC around 84 Kelvin and then make an explosion, right? So which will induce shock wave, we know. And then after the explosion, they measure the sample again, they find out, wow, it increased by 10 Kelvin or increased by 10 Kelvin. Also, they were able to recover the sample and, the, and uh, try to um, perform the XRD and the TEM measurements and demonstrate that indeed they gained a new phase after the explosion and with a short lattice constant C and the transition temperature is claimed to be 10 degree higher before the explosion. And the authors also mentioned that the, why, the reason why this uh, shock wave loading can induce the enhancement is still open. One of the possibilities, it may change the oxygen level in the material, as mentioned in, in this paper, okay. So all these previous uh, work, preliminary work demonstrate that uh, the TC that previously created under high pressure or either can be induced back pressure can be retained, but is it possible for the retained phase has a TC even higher than the TC that originally induced or enhanced by, by pressure? So here's another two interesting work. Okay, the first one is on uh, indium selenium. So firstly, the authors apply the pressure all the way up to around 53 GPA. As we can see here, above 40 GPA, the superconductivity kicks in and that has an increase to around nine Kelvin and then stays almost constant. But the exciting thing comes during the decompression, okay? So when normally when we remove the pressure, the TC will uh, re kind of reversible going back to the original, right, the TC. But here we, what we can see it is it increases, right? Instead of decreasing, it increases. And the maximum TC achieved and, uh, during the decompression is even much higher than the maximum TC achieved during compression. So this is a, this pressure compression has a long re reversible modulation and the highest TC is like eight Kelvin during decompression, which is 
almost double the TC, around four and five Kelvin during compression. And the authors also measures the carrier concentration as a function of pressure. So what they find out is during decompression, actually the carrier density remains almost a constant. Although later we, we see a slightly drop, but more or less is a constant during the decompression until the lowest pressure they, they unload here around 10 GPA. So the reason they argue why the decompression uh, can have a higher TC is as following. Because when we apply pressure, even though we increase the carrier concentration, which favors the TC enhancement, but at the same time, the phonon stiffening takes place, which is which will be uh, uh, opposite to which will be opposite to help to increase the TC. In other words, that's will decrease the TC based on the McMinion uh, formula. However, during the decompression, on one hand, the carrier concentration remains constant, and on the other hand, the phonon softening took place, so which favors the TC enhancement again. So combine these two effects, the author suggests that that's the, the reasoning why the decompression can have an even higher TC than which originally uh, induced under high pressure. So this also gives us hope that during the pressure quenching, there's a possibility we retained a phase with a TC that may be even higher than what we originally produced under pressure. Okay, and another work is reported this year by uh, Xiao Jia Chen's group, what they call is memory of pressure induced superconductivity in the phase change alloy and alloys germanium uh, antimony telluride. So at ambient pressure, it is at trigonal phase and uh, above 13.4 GPA, the pressure induced amorphodization with superconductivity around four Kelvin. And then at 28 GPA, it has another structural transition. It goes into the cubic phase. And we also see a dramatic TC increase here, almost doubled. The TC goes around 8.2 Kelvin. And when they slowly, uh, with unloading the cell and decreasing the pressure, we also see a very interesting uh, phenomenon. That's the superconductivity, which originally requires at least 13 GPA and now can persist down to 2.5 GPA and with the same TC around 4.2 Kelvin. And for this work, what the authors are trying to deliver uh, the important information to us is that this order helps. So when we apply the pressure on this material, you create a lot of disorders and this helps to maintain the, the phase when we, during the decompression, when we remove the pressure. So if there's a way to introduce disorders in those uh, compounds, which showing high TC and uh, and with uh, and high pressure, then according to what they uh, reported here, there might be a possibility that this phase can be quenched to lower pressure or ambient, but still with the same uh, high superconductivity uh, transition temperature. Okay. So after introducing those nice uh, work by other groups, here's the time for me to uh, talk about our own work. So recently we successfully demonstrate the, our pressure quenching technique for the following single crystals. First is a non-superconducting antimony, and we also we saw similar behavior in non-superconducting bismuth. Uh, and also we go to the binary compound, iron selenide, and also the non-superconducting copper doped iron selenide. So we proved this by stabilizing at the ambient pressure, the high pressure induced or enhanced high TC as well as non-superconducting states. And these results are qualitatively consistent with our solid state large elastic model calculation and provided by our collaborators from uh, Professor Yemi Ma's group. Okay. So firstly, I wanna show what tools we have. So the high pressure setup in our lab, we have a beryllium copper clamp cell, which can, uh, which is very, comparing to diamond MA cell is much uh, user friendly. And, uh, but the limit is for the pressure, we can only go to around two GPA. For the multi-type symmetric DAC, that depends on the size of the culate of diamond, we can go uh, around 100 GPA so far, experimentally. And also we have a, a diamond MV cell that can be adapted into PPMS, quantum design PPMs. So it's convenient to study um, superconductivity and other uh, magnetic order under different magnetic fields, 
all the way to seven Tesla using the PVMS we have in our lab. And also here we're showing you a, a really is a big monster here. And this is a Bridgman MV, uh, Bridgman type MV cell, okay? And uh, you can see the big rods here that all the way connected to the cell. That's the part that allow us to tune the pressure at the low temperature. So we can control the pressure at what, uh, I mean, all the way from 300 Kelvin to 1.2 Kelvin. And this makes our pressure quenching experiments possible. Okay. And also we have another uh, very uh, unique uh, system is the ultra sensitive magnetization measurements under high pressure. So this hyper mini high pressure cell is, is around 8.8 .8 millimeter in, uh, in this and also like three centimeter, the lens is very small. You can hold uh, in your hands like this. So this cell is uh, basically developed with the help from uh, pr Professor Aramis. <clears throat> and also we have collaborations with QD scientists. So we made some uh, modifications on the hardware as well as the software, which help us to uh, extract those extremely small magnetic signals inside a magnetic cell. So for resistivity measurements, I want to make a note here is when we put the least on the example, it's easy. So what we measured is that directly from the example. However, for magnetization measurements, if we load a cell in, inside this MPMS3, all the information are collected. The background of the magnetic cell, the die from the diamond, from the gasket, together with the example. So we really find a very nice way to extract the reliable signal from, the, uh, from our uh, example, which is only like uh, within a few 60 or 70 micrometer size, okay? And we use this technique not only get some nice results on superconductivity, but also on some other interesting topological order and magnetic order, for example, the skirmion. So I'm going to go this very fast since it's not really related to uh, superconductivity, but still very interesting. So for the skirmion material, we know uh, most of the skirmion material only exists in a very narrow temperature window. Uh, as shown here, it's between 55 to 58 Kelvin. But under pressure, we were able to expand this region all the way from 5 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. So that's really, again, make one uh, step forward for its application for information storage. Now let's uh, coming back to our main focus for today is the pressure quench pro process we developed recently. So basically, we want to take advantage of the energy barrier created between the matter stable phase and the stable phase. So by finding the right thermodynamic pass, we want to maintain the matter stable phase at ambient pressure, right? By using this energy barrier. So this is uh, oversimplified uh, steps, but that delivers our messages. So firstly, and at, atmosphere, uh, at ambient pressure, the material is non-superconducting. And then we add pressure, it turns into superconducting. And then at the right temperature, we choose the right temperature and the right pressure, we do the pressure quench. So let it, let example return to atmospheric pressure. And then we are able to retain the superconductivity, which was not exist at ambient before. Okay. And here we summarize our uh, standard sequential steps to obtain test and to characterize the high TC phase without pressure. So firstly, we need to map out the DCP phase diagram, basically at what's the TC at different pressure. And then we need to select a target phase we want to explore. And uh, at a phase under pressure, we call it the P8, applied pressure. And then we measure the resistivity as a function of time under the selected pressure to confirm that's indeed the phase we selected. And then we perform the pressure quench as the, at the selected pressure as well as the selected temperature. I'm going to show you this quenching temperature also plays a very important role on the retained TC. After that, we measure the TC of the retained phase immediately, right? And then we check stability as a function of time and of temperature to see whether this retained phase is stable as a function of time or like when we warm up to different temperature, whether it can still survive, okay? So the first thing we do is we revisit the case for antimony. So here, as I already showed before, the antimony goes through a series of structures with different TCs under pressures. So the first pressure point we choose is between the phase one and the phase two, a phase two, 
right, which is around 10.9 GPA, very close to this uh, phase boundary. So what we do is firstly, we uh, cool down the material that's represented by the black curve labeled I here. So which shows a, a superconductivity transition under pressure, that's as what we expected. And then at 77 Kelvin, we remove all the pressure very quickly. That's what we call it pressure quenching, right? And then we can see the resistance immediately increases. And then we cool down the sample again, following the right curve, we can see a superconductivity transition around three Kelvin was successfully retained. And after that, we go to different temperature and then cool down again. For example, here we go, firstly, we go to 131 Kelvin and go back. We can still see the superconductivity as indicated by the zero resistance, but the, we, we can already tell the TC actually moves down a little bit. And then we increase the maximum temperature. We warm up to 150, 45 Kelvin and then cool down again. As we can see, the superconductivity starts to degrade and no, no zero resistivity is observed, okay. After that, we choose another temp, uh, pressure that's around this boundary, okay. That's around this boundary between the mixed phase and the phase four. So we applied 29.5 GPA, and then we cool it down nicely, and we saw a transition around four Kelvin, which indicates the phase is indeed around here, right? Because below this phase, there's no superconductivity as high as four Kelvin, especially for this, uh, this is a little bit special case. So um, we know that, okay, we are really in the uh, target phase. And then we quench again at 77 Kelvin. We remove all the pressure, which means now the sample is at ambient pressure. And then we cool down again. We see a very nice transition around 3.2, 3.3 Kelvin. And then we do different thermal cycles, trying to pin down what's the highest temperature that we still can observe superconductivity. It turns out that when we warm up to 142 Kelvin, the superconductivity almost completely suppressed. That's represented by the gray, uh, gray line here, gray line here. So in the antibody, we were able to uh, perform pressure crunch at the 77 Kelvin for different uh, applied pressure. So in this phase diagram, the blue points represents the superconductivity TC under pressure, corresponding to the labeling here. And the red uh, diamonds shows that the quench, the TC after we perform the pressure quench, which means all these uh, red uh, points here represents the TC that for the example, without any pressure. So the pressure point here only means that's before the pressure quench was the applied pressure. So, <clears throat> And another interesting minor effect here is, as we can see, comparing these two points, the retained superconductivity is slightly higher than the original TC, even though not that much, but it's clear that it's definitely higher than before we, after we apply the pressure. Okay. So Sorry. before we get these uh, results can in- I, uh, Can I intervene? Can yes. I ask a question? Sure, yeah, please. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. With this kind of experiments, yes. you cannot ensure that it is the bulk of the sample which remains superconductor. You could still have a surface effect or anything like yeah, that. Because you are just measuring a TC. Sorry, I, I missed a second. Yeah, yeah, let me let me let me translate. Yeah, uh, Alou yeah. basically saying that uh, how do you prove that uh, the superconductivity, you know, after you do the crunch, is bulk? It could be surface effect. Uh, can be, whether it can be bulk or surface effect. Okay, right, I, I mean, think my, a, my yeah. answer is following. The firstly, of course, I mean, more uh, decisive measurement would be prove the, uh, the Meissler effect, right? Uh, right now, uh, we don't have the equipment to do the pressure quenching for magnetic studies. But uh, the other things we did try to uh, apply different current and we can see that's a indirect proof, but again, I, I think it's still open question. Yes, that's an open question. Whether it's really a surface state or it's a bulk effect. Part of the sample, part of the sample <laughs> can be It's not necessarily a totally bulk effect. Yes, but I mean, that's waiting for further improvements. Okay. But I mean, rather we can, we can argue both ways. We can say it's bulk, we can say it's non-bulk. So I, I agree that's an open question. And definitely we want to prove that it's, uh, we want to know whether that's also a bulk effect or not. Yes. 
So I guess can you, can you do key capacity measurement? <laughs> no, because no, no. This, I, I'll, I'll mention that later. Why the challenge is not? Oh, 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 oh because, because yes. it's, you're doing it in situ, right? Yeah, okay. Yes, we're doing in situ measurement. So this okay, is okay, okay, more okay. challenging than it looks like. Okay. So the okay. other, so for the unseen night, actually, I think that's another a nice model system. Because firstly, when we present our results, some of uh, the uh, collaborators or people they get interested, they ask, "Well, you demonstrate in a pure element." How about in the compound materials? So we come to choose ancillinite for different reasons. So ancillinite, since its discovery, attract a lot of uh, attention because of different reasons. And one of the reasons we choose this material is it really has a very uh, dramatic uh, enhancement by pressure. That's one of the few materials that have this property. So under without pressure, you only has a superconducting TC around nine Kelvin, but under pressure, you can boost up to around 40 Kelvin or 39 Kelvin. That's almost quadruple the original TC. And also recently we have a uh, nice work done by other groups to use while uh, liquid gating or ion intercalation to get a TC to even above 40 Kelvin, 45, 48 Kelvin. But today we are focused on the high pressure effect part. So this work has been published in, uh, a few months ago on PNS and we also, uh, Professor Boswich also write a very nice comment uh, articles on it. And uh, this month, we also post uh, Professor Chu has got invited to write a comment on this work in which in this article, we express the impact of our work as well as the challenges. One of the open questions just as uh, uh, the one of the questions just raised about the bulk effect, whether it is the bulk or just filamentary. And uh, so that's why we are working on the magnetic measurements to further prove the nature of the retained phase. Okay. So firstly, we, we did a measurement, a careful measurement on of the receptivity of ancillinite superconductor and the copper doped ancillinite, which is non-superconducting at room temperature. Okay, so we map out the phase that uh, the room temperature resistance a function of uh, pressure. As you can see, okay, the numbers here denotes the order of the pressure. So firstly, we increase to around 20 GPA, and then we slightly uh, we uh, gradually remove the pressure and go back to ambient. So this hysteresis between the blue curve and the red curve actually gives a hint that there is a possibility to lock the phase because of this hysteresis. hysteresis. And uh, also I want to mention that when we decompress or reload the cell under room temperature, we didn't see any retainable phase, which means when we retain the reload the cell all the way to a zero pressure and we measure, the receptivity, there's the superconductivity is still around eight, nine Kelvin. There's no change of that. Okay, so the first experiments for pressure quenching we did at low temperature is we choose 77 Kelvin at the nitrogen environment. So the first, the, the dash line here indicates the, pre, the TC, the superconducting transition for the pristine example. And then we warm up to 77 Kelvin and, and uh, apply pressure, right? And then we measure it. So it is go up to around the onset around 30 Kelvin. And then we quench it at 77 Kelvin. And then we cool down again. That's the uh, third curve, right? That's the green curve. So we retain the TC, but the TC is only around 20 Kelvin. But already it's a good news because that's almost double the original TC. And then we warm all the way up to 300 Kelvin and then cool, cool down again. Apparently the retain phase is annealed away by this uh, heat, by this thermodynamics. <laughs> So another interesting thing we want to point out is here, we, uh, when we go to higher pressure, the majority of phase of this compound is non-superconducting, as we can tell from this blue curve, right? At under 11 GPA. And then again, we warm up to 77 Kelvin, we do the pressure quench, and we cool down again, we find out it remained unsuperconducting. The most amazing effect is when we bring the example all the way up to 300 Kelvin, and then cool back again, we find out this non-superconducting phase actually persists. It doesn't kneel the way, it, re, it, remained, uh, it remains there. So this is a phase we're trying to do more measurements because this sample, we can take it out for squid study and other uh, characterizations which without uh, the requirement of high pressure. So we also did a very detailed temperature uh, thermal cycles. So we, after we quench at 77 Kelvin, we go to 30, 60, 100. I have to say this set of data is really uh, difficult to obtain because we want to 
do it at one sample and at a uh, continuous run. So normally what would happen is during warming up the sample, we lose the contact. Then we have to start from the beginning, repeat everything again. But fortunately, we were able to collect a very nice uh, data set from 77, 30 Kelvin all the way to 300 Kelvin. As you can see here, the TC slowly uh, degrades and the coming return back to its original a TC around 10 Kelvin when we warm up to above 250 Kelvin. Basically, that's overlaps. So, so here is a phase diagram that's showing all the runs we do under pressure and all the TCs we obtain by removing the pressure completely at 77 Kelvin. It is nice that we were able to retain the TC as high as around 24 Kelvin, but we cannot reach to this region, as we can see here. That's why we decided to do a further pressure crunch at a much lower temperature under helium uh, uh, environment. So as shown in this the figure on the, on the left, right? So when we remove the pressure at 4.2 Kelvin and we warm up again, we can see the superconductivity, the retained TC is almost the same as the TC that under pressure, okay? But again, when we warm up to 300 Kelvin and, and then cool down again, the high TC annuls away and it comes to be more close to the original one, around 10 Kelvin. And here we, uh, we also tried the high pressure quench and we find out here lies the difference between the uh, quenching at 77 Kelvin and 4.2 Kelvin. As I just mentioned, the retained, the retained phase when we quench at 77 Kelvin was able to survive all the way to 300 Kelvin. However, if we quench at 4.2 Kelvin and we warm up all the way to room temperature and cool back again, the, the original TC recovers around 10 Kelvin, okay? And uh, we also did it very uh, systematically, a uh, thermal uh, cycles to, lo to look at the temperature stability. As you can see from the, which is different from the previous data, that's there's a obvious gap, right? Between the 200 Kelvin and the 300 Kelvin when we perform the quench at 4.2 Kelvin. So now let me put together the pressure quenching for 4.2 Kelvin and 77 Kelvin. So the achievement we, we got is by quenching at 4.2 Kelvin, we were able to retain the superconducting phase with the TC as high as around 37 Kelvin without any pressure, without any pressure. And uh, that's the difference between quenching at 4.2 and the 77. But we know isinite is superconducting at the beginning. So people may have doubts on whether it has something to do with the residual pressure or has something to do with this original superconducting state. That's why in parallel, we are running another pressure quenching experiments for copper doped ionic which is non-superconducting at the ambient pressure and defend, depends on the doping level of the copper. It requires different pressure to drive it into superconducting states. And for our single crystal, we need at least three GPA to make the material superconducting. So the figure A here is showing different, uh, it's the same piece of sample. We applied around six GPA, as you can see here, we try to match the same uh, uh, applied pressure. And then we quench at 77 Kelvin and 4.2 Kelvin separately. And as we can see from the green curve that's quenched uh, from 77 Kelvin and the red curve that's quenched at 4.2 Kelvin, it retained almost the same TC, around 20 Kelvin. Once we go to higher pressure, we can lock in the long superconducting phase. And we also, we, we test the stable, uh, temperature stability for different quenching conditions at 4.2 Kelvin, at 77 Kelvin. We will also uh, perform the pressure quench at other temperatures, such as 120 Kelvin, much higher than 77 Kelvin. And we can, again, we can retain the superconductivity for this material. So that doesn't mean we have to retain, we have to remove the pressure as low as 77 Kelvin. So the quench temperature can be even higher. So that's still under, under uh, explore, <clears throat> investigation. So lastly, there's a very important test. Also, most of uh, people ask the question, how stable are your uh, retained phase? Is it only exist for one run or a few minutes? So we, so to test this, we keep the cell uh, with the probe under in the nitrogen environment at 77 Kelvin for a week. And we test at different time, like two hour, one day, two day, all the way to one, one week. And we didn't see any change of the, the superconnect signal, the TC and also the, the raw data. They really uh, sitting on top of each other, which means there's no degrading for the retained phase 
at least 47 days we tested. So after that, we warm up and then perform other measurements. That's for the pressure quench doped insulin act. Okay, so now here is showing the phase diagram. So different from the insulin act, when we quench this material at 4.2 Kelvin, at 77 Kelvin, eventually we can retain the same TC. But I want to point out at lower pressure, the TC retained by performing the pressure quench at 4.2 Kelvin is much higher than the retained TC when we quench at 77 Kelvin. However, when we move to higher quenching pressure, they start to merge together. And this also demonstrates that the chemical doping also plays an important role on the quenching effect. Okay, so- um, Sorry, can yes. I again ask, ask a small question? Yes, you are yeah, please. On, only monitoring TC in yes. your analysis of the data. Yes. But if I look at the curve, yes. there seems to be a change of the paramagnetism of the, of the normal state. For yes. instance, in figure B, you have a big change from the red to the blue curve. Yes. Is, is that, can, can, do you have any systematic study of what happens to the normal state behavior? Not when yet, you, no, not yet. Any correlation, well, yes. any correlation between the, mag, the modifications in TC and the modifications in normal state? That's, that's, a very, that's a very significant question. Yes, I mean, that's, our, that's what we are doing. I think one thing uh, we're trying to do is we're trying to really do the X-ray measurements to, to look at really the structure dynamics before and after the pressure quench, which we cannot really get the direct information by the resistivity measurements. So right now we're just comparing the TC uh, by before and before quench or after quenching to, to make a conclusion that what kind of phase we are retaining. I think the more rigorous uh, thing we should do is we do a, a, like X-ray studies on the structural dynamics. And also if we can retain the phase, here nice the question as I can show you, if we warm the sample up to room temperature, then it, the retained superconductivity disappears. So that makes it difficult for us to take out the sample and to perform other mm -hmm. additional uh, experiments to answer the questions you just raised, but that's what we, we we're working very hard on that to to find a way to either so Daniel, transfer Daniel, the sample. Daniel, Daniel or... has a question. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. <clears throat> Did Dan, Daniel, come to Yeah, uh, I have a general question actually. It's a very nice data, but uh, what is actually the lesson we can learn? Uh, is it? Uh, clear really which physics is uh, may be responsible. In which cases can you retain TC after quenching, in which cases not? It looks like uh, it's kind of a, a matter of luck. In some cases you are lucky you can, in some other cases uh, you don't. <laughs> and uh, what is the message actually? What can we learn? What is the physics? That, 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 that's we, good. That's is there any good predictive point. power actually? Can we predict that for example, take this particular material, treat it like this mm -hmm. or that, and then you can retain TC. I agree with this question. Uh, this is a little bit the sense of my questions, which is that in principle, when you apply the pressure, you do something to the sample. And, uh, yes. and, yeah. and then when you cool down, do you, keep, do, do you keep the sample in the state it was when you uh, modified it by pressure or uh, do you have an evolution towards something else or do you keep only part of the sample in this position? Right, all right. this needs to be clar clarified, I think. Yeah, it looks like all this business has uh, not really uh, very much to do uh, with superconductivity per se, but rather it's uh, what happens with the material, uh, whether uh, oh. it's metastable or not, at what is actually the dynamic of transformation, whether it's uh, martensitic like or not, and so on and so forth. So that's actually pure material that's science. Right. And that's, uh, material. that's the fact that it happens to be superconducting. That's actually, in some cases, it's superconducting. In some cases, it might be magnetic, which can be also retained or not retained. Mm. So uh, I just wonder. <laughs> What, no, I, I, what is I, I, the message? What can we learn from it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think that that's a fair question, but uh, it's also, you know, we all know it's very, very difficult to do uh, the, these sort of measurement uh, and do diffraction measurement to actually obtain the, the, the microscopic crystal structure. Yeah. 
question. This was actually the question I, I asked these guys when <laughs> when they did the experiment originally. But but it's yeah. to do under pressure and then in situ to do diffraction experiment is actually not not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. I think to under in another way. I think also here is from experimental approach, right? I, I know. I think uh, I'm not sure whether this is really what you are looking for, but right now that's also like uh, so through computational or use the mathematic uh, physics laws and those formulas or the deep uh, physics trying to search for those metastable material. But apparently uh, it's very, I mean, it's very difficult to do that. It's just nowadays using the big data science to trying to discover new superconductors. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a, I would say it still needs a lot of efforts. I think right now it needs effort from both experimental way and the theoretical way to come together and then can answer the questions, right? What the material should we look for? What are the for mechanisms example, behind uh, this? Can you give any advice to people who are working with these hydrides? Uh, what should we do really to retain uh, this room temperature or maybe even just higher TC uh, in uh, all these hydrides? Yeah, but what should we do? Yeah. What, what's the direction? How to, um, mm -hmm. uh, which direction uh, do we have to think uh, and uh, what should we try and so on? Any lessons? <laughs> what can you advise to the people? I think for hydrides, okay, I'm, I'm, I mean, definitely there's more. That's speculation, actually. So for hydrides, I would say, I would, uh, actually, that's also what we are, we are doing in our lab. We are building uh, uh, apparatus to do the hydrides. So the thing we are trying to do is we start from the materials that's more comparing to other hydrides is don't need that much pressure, right? You don't want to start from like 300 GPA, lower pressure and which has a hope to uh, be stable at, at ambient pressure. I would say from that point of view, experimentally. Mm -hmm. I don't have, a, I mean, a clear mechanism to distinguish which kind of hydrides can be retained or which kind of hydrides cannot be retained. I would say there's a lot still to learn. We are still but I guess, on the I guess, I guess early Daniel's, stages. I guess Daniel's these, question, yes. the key question he, he asks is, is I guess uh, maybe you can shed some light. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's uh, you you do see this effect in this uh, in this material that it retain yes. presumably a, a bulk superconductor. Yes. But how do you know? I guess uh, which materials to try. <laughs> I mean to make this work. I mean, I guess you you, you have this model where they have this two metal stable. It's a very nice model. The question is, uh, did you, I mean, obviously you cannot try everything, right? So you have to, I think, yeah. So uh, any, I think the firstly, for... it, I, tend, I tend to believe, it, it may not be correct, it should have phase transition. Right? Oh, so you want to look for material with- uh, With phase transition. Near, near uh, structural preferably phase like first order structural transition. Not necessarily, but you can see we are choosing these models that have different phase tran transition. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also, I mean, from theoretical part, we can calculate those, uh, here, the, the energy barriers and to compare whether it's, it makes sense when you do the crunch, you can overcome the thermodynamic energy or not. This can be a reference. Mm -hmm. This can be a very good reference, of course. But so, for example, would it be yes. good to have martensitic transitions? Uh, or it uh, wouldn't help much? Because okay. uh, structural transitions are of different types. And some of these are martensitic when uh, uh, when you transform part of the sample, it creates uh, pressure for the other parts, and yes. then you can stabilize some intermediate phase and so on. So what do you see? Would it be helpful, for example, to try uh, this martensitic transition or maybe not? Yeah, so, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer now. I, I guess, I guess you, you would want to look for, you know, materials with uh, structural phase transition at very high yes. pressure. Yes, and then and then you, I mean potentially you, you can hopefully crunch and maintain the same pressure hopefully at least at low temperature right that's what these guys yes. were doing they basically yes. take off the pressure at very low temperature with the yes. hope that they will retain the high, yes. yeah yeah with the hope that it will retain the high pressure phase without yes. you know you know that's unstable room temperature right yeah but uh, mm -hmm. but well, for the matter stability really depends on material I mean it depends on how many days we can we can maintain it. That that's really, right, right. I mean, that has to be ex determined by experiments. Yeah. Hello. All, all this is really material research, and we know at the time of the at the beginning of the high TCs, we got these kind of problems, understanding the best way to keep all the oxygen to be to be at the optimal for uh, IPCO seven right, or things right, like right. that. Right. Yeah, we right. we yes. had to learn that 
it was a, a heavy a, a heavy work to understand mm -hmm. at which at which temperature you had to 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 uh, to quench your sample to to room temperature a little bit fast to keep the ma maximum oxygen content. So I, I can understand that these kind of things may happen, but uh, okay, <laughs> this is this is a material research business. Okay, fair, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we hope we can come with more more <laughs> evidence to convince you. Although, or, although, yeah. it, although it's difficult because uh, to to uh, to to be practical, it will be extremely hard to to. Uh, to 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 treat um, large masses of samples. Uh, if, if one thinks about applications or getting superconductivity yes. at very high temperature, this will be a very very difficult task. So uh, so claiming in Nature and Science that we are ready to 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 do uh, Josephson junctions at room temperature, etc., is would be would be a, a very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, no, but, but I mean, even even the room temperature superconductor, the claim itself is being questioned, right? Yes, and I'm not yeah, saying yes. that, that, that yes. even the claim itself has been that, that people don't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. some people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Con I would say controversial, right? Still uh, unsettled. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so are there any other questions for for Liangzi? from students? Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, students typically are very, very quiet in, in these. Uh... And last, I just want to post a, a small advertisement here as with mm -hmm. me and uh, other collaborators. <clears throat> oh, oh you're, you're writing some, oh, you. It's a, oh, it's oh, a oh, research you're... topic, yes. So welcome to contribute to work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, any questions? I appreciate all the comments and questions. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. very helpful. Any other question for him? It's okay. <laughs> okay. If not, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank yeah. you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> next week will be very exciting talk. Yeah. Be, be completely, entirely physics oriented. <laughs> no, no material <laughs> science. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>